Good evening, everybody. This is this month's edition of the Med Talks Book Club. Uh, many thanks for joining us this rather tropical autumn evening. Um, <laughs> hope you had a good day, but hopefully we can make your evening as pleasant as the day was with tonight's book. I'd like to introduce my co-host today, um, Mehran and Fahim. Do you want to say hi? Hello. Hello, Hello everyone. Hi, good evening. Hello. So Hello. today's book is Exit West, um, and it's by a, an author called Mohsin Hamid. So Mohsin Hamid describes his books as being a divided man's conversation with himself. And he has embarked on a conversation reflecting the fictional account of two migrants from a country unknown to countries known. His love story of our protagonist, Saeed, who lives with his parents working in advertising, and Nadia, who has belligerently left the family home to ride her life as a single lady clad in a burqa. Their journey takes them through doors with mystical power. And unlike Lucy and Peter, these doors tunnel to freedom and sandy beaches. There is death, both intimate and unfamiliar. There is separation and reunion. There is a journey west and horrors in the east. At times, the detail isn't clear, and yet it is most vividly seen when horror raises its head. At times, the text is confusing, and the detail is designed to deceive and subterfuge, almost to make the reader feel that these are irrelevant. The book does shock at times, and probably not one that I can recommend to my parents. There are paralyzing power cuts in London, an attempted robbery in the US, West Coast, threatening thugs in Mykonos, and boys playing football with a human head in the refugees' homeland. I was intrigued when I chose the book, knowing very little of the author, um, but wishing to know more of a refugee story. Um, by reading about it from someone who is from multiple nations and has himself experienced migration firsthand, as well as seen the impact of refugees in various nations, I was in some ways disappointed not to hear his narrative come through. But I did want an account that intrigued, intrigued me and left me to think and ask questions. And this book did so in abundance. Was I disappointed? No. I expected the author to be honest with himself. And this I felt it, I got. He doesn't seem to appease many with this narrative, although I'm sure others would disagree. It is the first time I've read a non-fiction book also from somebody who hails from Pakistan. And I'm yet to discover whether this book reflects Pakistani non-fictional books across the genre. Um, but having read this book, I do feel as though there probably is a huge um, array of talent out there that I think us are probably due to explore further. And if anything, the book has received a wonderful stamp of recommendation and that comes in the form of being made into a movie for Netflix, which I believe is due to come out next year. Now, I know my, my co-host has always have lovely views on these books, and the topic itself is very emotive. Um, one of the reasons, again, I mentioned why we chose the book was, why I chose the book was to get a, an opinion or position that maybe reflected the human story of, of refugees. And I think if you listen to other book clubs and other book reviews, a lot of the themes are around the love story itself and about the relationship as those are universal concepts. Everybody can relate to family. Everybody can relate to re, um, a romantic love notion with somebody else. But very few can maybe relate to being refugees. And I hope that this book allows those that maybe don't feel the same empathy for refugees the ability to do so. I've said my bit. I let Fahim start first, and then we'll go to Mehran with their initial discussions. I will move on from there. Thanks, Zubair. Um, yeah, so uh, I think you've done a great uh, description to dis 
uh, describe the book. Uh, my initial thoughts are, I knew Mohsin Hamid from The Reluctant Fundamentalist, a book came out in 2007. Um, although interestingly, he wrote it before 9-11, um, but then he changed things after 9-11. So there's an interesting backstory uh, with that, and that protagonist is from Pakistan. As you mentioned, we've got these two protagonists, uh, Naid, uh, Nadia and uh, Saeed, um, and we don't really have many other names during the story. They're the two characters that are named and that was a deliberate ploy um, as part of the book. So we focus in on them, as well as the unnamed city and the unnamed country that they're from, which also has an interesting uh, background in that doesn't want to actually stigmatize any nation of the world with a conflict or even wanting it to his homeland in Pakistan, God forbid. So there was a rationale for keeping that uh, open in that way. There's so many things to cover tonight, obviously, and uh, Zubair, I'm sure you'll help us to uh, um, funnel it down to the important points. Um, the ones I found really interesting were the concepts of actually loyalty. I think that's running throughout the actual book, how the two are trying to be loyal to each other and their struggle. The concept of refugees. What is a refugee? I think we should explain what a refugee is. A refugee is someone who's forced to displace their homeland with no opportunity for return. Um, so I think that pretty much uh, aptly describes what they are as opposed to migrants, uh, which are slightly different, uh, but an important distinction nevertheless. And in addition to that, there's also the concept of mortality, uh, we may touch on as well. Obviously, his uh, two closest people to him, his mother and father both die in the actual novel. Uh, spoiler alert for anyone, I'm giving away a lot of things here. Um, but obviously, there's a lot of death, as we know, there's a civil war that's going on. So the concept of mortality is always there in the background. People dying, as uh, as we said, you know, people we know and people we don't know. So there's a lot of things to tease out, um, and we'll do that during the course of the evening. But those are some of the themes that I thought I'd start the evening with. I'll pass on to the baton to Meran. Thank you for humans of air. Um, yeah, so Mohsin Ahmed, I've, I've, I heard about him um, when obviously he had written The Reluctant Fundamentalist. He's, he's the author of four novels, very much credited and revered in, in terms of in Pakistan as well as international, as, especially in the European and, um, and far west. Um, it's The story was quite quite interesting and it just did highlight that I know Fahim you mentioned about refugee but I, I guess every refugee was also initially asylum seeker so an asylum seeker is an individual who's seeking international protection and this this kind of this this journey where they've exited west from where they are um and you know the imagery the the doors the companionship the love the the interaction between religion and religiosity as well as spirituality I think it really does um, come up quite prominent in this book. Um, I enjoyed it, and I think you know, uh, it's it's one of those things that I decided to actually get a hard copy. So do not get a Kindle version of any <laughs> book, to be honest. Um, and it was, you know, I, th I did find myself lost at times, but but it made me reread the phrase again. I think there was a um, a sentence that was a page long, which is you know goes against every kind of um uh, grammatical uh, rule in terms of writing but it certainly made you actually revisit the whole passage again which is perhaps the reason why he's done it that way um but it's, it's a it's a fascinating story but at the same time it, you know i went into this book hoping to learn a lot more about the challenges as well as the um i guess the the colorful uh, positivity that perhaps we lack, you know, being from the West, um, you know, we, we did try to figure out where, where this place is, I'm assuming it's Syria, but it could be anywhere, in all honesty, uh, because unfortunately there is so much warfare and, uh, and turmoil in, in a number of countries. But, you know, it, it certainly does open a huge avenue and lots of conversations. So I look forward to this discussion. Thank you very much. Um, huh. I think for me, first of all, it was a case of let's talk about refugees first, because that's obviously one of the major themes in this book. Uh, and, and as sad as it is, there's a part of almost 80 million people in this world right now who are refugees. Uh, and last year alone, 14 million people were seeking refugee status. And to add to the tragedy, 40% um, of these are children. Uh, and, and it really is um, a, a sort of a huge issue that I believe 
the, the discussion and the discourse at times here can be quite stigmatised against them. We see posts on Sky News and BBC News and other news channels and we think that we're being invaded by people. But actually, reading this book and trying to explore the narrative from their end and to understand their position, I think, is what's important. And I hope that this book lets us do that. I guess the issue really is, does Mr. Hamid in his book, does he portray refugees well? And I think part of the first part, the first part of, to that real question is really the land where they come from, how does he portray that? Now, I know we discussed this before, but I think it'd be important just to kind of run by what we thought. My personal feeling was that I think this is a country that he's talking about is Syria. I could be wrong, but my impression was, Marani said Syria too, and I would agree with you. And from what we've maybe read about ourselves or met, or met individuals from that country, it's rather different to how he's portrayed it. We appreciate they've gone through a difficult time in their history right now, but they're, I mean, Damascus itself is the longest, longest habitually uh, residing city of, you know, in, in the whole of human history. So I think it goes back at least 5,000 years. And we, we never got a flavor for that. We never got anything positive from that nation. What we did get was that they were overrun by militants. There was a whole host of unseemly social behavior. And then there was the rather ghastly scene of those children playing with a human head. And there was nothing positive for that. And, and I just thought, I, I think, I, I thought he did that because he wanted to give an idea that these people are fleeing their nation because it's so bad. But I think I would have preferred there to have been some narrative there to say it's not always been that bad. Is, is that our cues a bit? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> I think, I think um, yeah, it was, it was interesting to have that discussion. I think, um, you know, with, with this book, I think it's, what, 220, 230 pages in terms of length. Um, around 40% of that book was actually about Said and Nadia, the, uh, the two main characters within that book. Um, still being in the place where they were. Uh, obviously, the the kind of the the uh, daily life, the um, the understanding, the picture, the vivid imagery um, is quite colourful. But a lot of it was was painted in in a negative way. And I was hoping, you know, that um, even even to this day, the the valley of the lemon tree. I'm, I'm still <laughs> trying to find out why why that you know. Uh, why was that imagery there in the first place? Um, obviously, lemons, you know, they're, they're used for purifying and uh, and cleanliness, but at the same time, it only moved from one house to the next, and that, that caused the lemon tree to die. And maybe that was just kind of an uh, analogy for, for what migration can potentially do to someone. Um, so it was a, a lot of it was uh, was quite negative, I, th I thought, um, especially when, when we're trying to combat... Uh, the dehumanization of migrants, I felt he didn't take that opportunity uh, to try and portray, especially in this book, because he's obviously got a position to try and do that. But yeah. for reasons we may know or we may not, it didn't really happen. I don't know what your thoughts are, Fahim. Yeah, no, I think uh, it, it was mixed. Obviously, the author probably did want to humanise migrants, and that's because he is one himself, and he acknowledges that in all the interviews that he's had uh, a nomadic existence with Pakistan, London, California, New York, I think, you know, some of his abode. So he's brought that in, and he visits the Mediterranean, which brings in the Greece. So a lot of it, although we can't say it's autobiographical, he has brought in, I think, to some degree, some personal experiences to comment on the countries that they've been to. Uh, and obviously there is this concept of negativity, I think, to some degree, even though the actual magic doors, and I think this is a time to speak about these magic doors that take you from one nation to another, which reminded me as a C.S. Lewis fan of Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. I've got to be honest, but, you know, it's the wardrobe at the back of the house, right? <laughs> so going to Narnia, but it's obviously he must have taken on board that concept uh, for his own book. But obviously taking that and it, it's made the whole migration experience very simplified because that's not what a refugee is. They don't go through a door and then come straight onto another place. There will be endless weeks, months, years of saving money. Um, there's obviously the actual danger of the journey often, uh, whether that be you know the US-Mexico border or coming from the Mediterranean on a ship or something or some sort of a raft. And um, 
none of that's shown in this by because you've actually destroyed all that by saying you just go through a magic door and you've gone somewhere else. Well, that makes sense if you're going on holiday somewhere. That'd be nice. You don't have to queue at the airport. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about holidays abroad. We're talking about uh, refugee stations. So I, I think in that way, a lot of people, you know, myself, we, we will take that the wrong way uh, and think that it does a disservice to refugees in their plight. But at the same time, it, it's a nuanced book. So he does make us humanize. And that's mainly through the, the things that uh, Saeed and Nadia get up to, you know, the often remarks of them smoking a joint. <laughs> I've forgotten how many times that that's there. It's tried there to try and make them seem as if this could be any modern city that they're living in. This could be you and I. This could be, you know, someone working in an advertising agency, middle class upbringing, university education. One day they've got it all you know, trying to actually have a courtship with starting with a Chinese restaurant and then the next minute they're in a war-torn area. So he's trying to humanize in that way and I get that, but I think on balance is displaced by the actual journey not being actually uh, explained more in, and using the magic door as a magic realism to try and actually negate that. Um, has taken away that bit for me. And it's a short book, as you said, Meram, which is important to say, the two over just 220 words, you've got to be very concise. And there's a lot of buildup with them coming at, you know, for a good 90 odd pages where they haven't left anywhere. And by the time they do move, it's quite quick places that they're having to move from Greece after a few pages, they move to London after, you know, a few more. And so you haven't got enough time to talk about each of these places uh, and to give them justice. Um, and there's a nice, end chapter, which I won't spoil for people, but, but obviously brings things to, to a close. But those are my thoughts on uh, how he tries to cope with the refugee issue. Thank you, Fain. Well, you mentioned, obviously, there were middle class in the background. They should smoke weed together um, on and off throughout the book, not that we condone drugs. My question really to you both was, do you think that Nadia and Said are our typical refugees? Before you read the book, would you have said, well, actually, that's what refugees are like, where they come from, this is how they are, this is how they behave. Or do you think the author gave a very different view of refugees for a different reason? I think, um, do you want me to start, Meron? Um yeah. So in terms of refugees, I mean, I'm used to knowing about them personally through the Rohingya refugees. So I know more about them and how they've left Myanmar and they're in Bangladesh now in the Cox's Bazaar. Uh, and they're not like the book. Okay. And there's, you know, more than a million or so of them. And th they're not like the book here. They're not portrayed that way um, at all. Um, but obviously, this is a fiction. It's a book of fiction. We have to yes. remember. Uh, and, you know, it's popular culture. And, and does it need to exactly mirror? every single refugee's experience. It can't do that. It never set out to do that. No. Um, and it has to be an interesting book. And, and really, the refugee thing is is counted with the whole love story between the two, between the two main protagonists. That's what gives impetus and interest to the refugee story. If it had just been Nadia or just Saeed leaving, I think um, that might be a bit of an issue. But with them both involved in this courtship and the uh, the first love experience and then bringing that into the actual refugee experience, I think that's what's making it interesting to me. Yeah. And I think you mentioned a good point there for him because each nation will have its own kind of refugee. And, and I must admit that the refugees I've met from Syria, the vast majority have been middle class. And maybe from other nations, they haven't been quite the same. So for me, in some ways, the portrayal of them coming from the background they did come from was actually a lot more realistic if we're presuming they're actually from Syria. Um, obviously, they could have been from another part of the nation uh, of the world. Um, but quite clearly, he was trying to maybe look at it from their angle. Um, but I appreciate if you were in Cox's Bazaar, then knowing what I've heard about from our um, friends at, from the Rohingya, obviously quite a different population. So I appreciate the challenges there are very different. Um, I was, I was going to mention a point actually there because you mentioned Cox's Bazaar because I think it's important that we get an idea of where the refugees go. So as t up until now, there's always been an appreciation that refugees go throughout the world. But the perception always being that maybe we take the most refugees in the world, but quite clearly we don't. Um, and it's interesting when you read into it how little we do for these people. Uh, and it's quite sad in some ways because you think we are quite affluent in this part of the world, but we, we're not very generous, I think, that would be fair to say, when it comes to these. Uh, you mentioned Cox's Bazaar. So in terms of that, Fahim, um, last year, according to the UN, 
uh, there were almost 900,000 refugees in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. which makes them ninth in the list. Any guess on who was the top of the list of most refugees hosted last year in the world? I'd put um, Jordan high up. No, actually, not last year. This is last oh, year, sorry, not oh, general, last just last year. Yeah. Just last year. Um, Any idea? No. No, go on. Go on to it. Turkey. Okay. Turkey took in a phenomenal number of refugees, 3.6 million refugees they took in last year. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, I appreciate what you're saying the thing there with the doors, but mm -hmm. quite clearly the vast majority of refugees don't go very far. They just seem to be going locally to where they're being displaced. There's only one nation in the top 10 last year that was from a what we would term as being a developed nation, which was Germany. And they took in 1.1 million refugees. Um, so well done to them. But quite clearly, mm. there's a lot of absent names on that list. So just as an aside, because you mentioned Cox's, Cox's Bazaar, so I just thought I'd take the opportunity there just to mention that part. I want to just delve into one thing, because um, he, he talks about refugees in the book. He talks about the natives in the book there too. He talks about different kinds of natives in different parts of the world, and he portrays them in different lights. And I wanted to just see what you guys thought of what he gave you in terms of impression of what was a good refugee, but also what was a good native. So in terms of what he kind of said in the book, what made you think he was trying to say was a good refugee? And what do you think he was trying to say would make a good native? I think I'm, I'm, I'll start with the native bit. Um, yeah. So so as, as we as we found as as the, the journey migrated west, um, there's obviously people who who stood out quite quite different in their kind of personal, you know, physical features, uh, quite persistent, uh, very loyal, willing to support and understand the kind of the, the migrant journey, the refugee problem. Um, obviously, then then coming to London, which you know there were some similarities in terms of how they lived. And let's let's for the argument's sake, let's just say Syria <laughs> for the course of this discussion. Um, and there was, you know, the, the way the police and um, uh, the the armed forces were kind of surrounding them and raising raising alarm. But then at the same time, they didn't take the final step, which occurred in Syria. So there was still kind of understanding some um, some means of actually, you know, observing um, some degree of human right uh, in their interaction. But then when it comes to the, uh, Marin uh, in USA, um, the the natives perhaps it was it was the fact that the the whole country is you know perhaps they don't want to admit it but it's it's, it's based on immigration you had natives who were uh, you know you could argue uh, they underwent genocide uh, all those centuries year all those centuries ago and ever since uh, colonies have been built up and and perhaps everyone is trying to find that that equation that kind of formula to try and live a Qual, you know, quality of life where you have equal opportunities, and perhaps because of the fact that those kind of principles were shared in the community where they settled in the far, far west and towards the end of the journey, was perhaps where they felt most at home with the natives in terms of welcoming. Um, so that's that's why that's kind of what I felt when when he talks about natives. Yeah, I thought similar to what you said, Maron, in terms of the native. I thought. Because you've talked about the America thing, I'll bring in the British aspect. So I think with Britain and with the author having dual citizenship and British identity as well, um, it's a good point to bring in, obviously, British. Uh, there was a British Empire and they looked at natives in a different way throughout the empire. They were often uh, seen or portrayed as unsophisticated, uncivilized human beings. And so I thought the way that it, they were trying to show natives in in England, it was an interesting word and terminology. We never heard citizens <laughs> or, or other terms. It was native. And I found that a peculiar word to use because of that connotation with the empire and Britain in, in particular. When you talk about natives in, in, in USA, America, you often think about uh, native Indian Americans, maybe, don't you? And that sort of a concept. And, and near the end of the book, he tries to really explain what a native is in many words. Uh, and it feels almost like a bit of an English book near the end where he's trying to actually explain what a native is to break it down for you. But it was quite interesting the comparison of those two when you when you read the book you would come across that and think 
wow, this is how we're, we're describing it. Why are we using that word? So that's interesting. It must be a talking point. And the concept of the good refugee, I think that brings to mind the concept of the good immigrants. Where I think that's what, I mean, if we uh, juxtapose both words or interpose them, what's the difference between immigrant and refugee in this situation? They're doing a job, getting wages, trying to make a life for themselves. Yeah. And whereas refugees, as I said at the beginning, they just don't have a chance of going ever back home. Whereas a migrant does have that chance and may choose to or not do so at the end. So I think there's obviously the concept of abiding by what's going on and also the concept that you see in modern day camps that are there for refugees when they come first of all which he tries to explain and they're living at the periphery of the camp uh, in Greece for instance and how things can happen and you know you, you just have to be a bit careful and the facilities are not quite a one as the the rest of the population so there is a form of separation and really underlying all of that there's an undercurrent of nationalism I would say in the book as well which I think considering we've had a very interesting uh, vote on this in terms of European elections in Britain it had another tinge to it another layer as to what can happen when uh, these sort of um, concepts are brought alive and how they can spill over into the streets. What he was trying to do in some ways was show this could happen to you anywhere. The rioting that was happening uh, in London, it could happen in uh, wherever you are. And by the end of the book, with the, the magic doors, everyone's going from everywhere to anywhere. It's basically a, a global airport, isn't it? Everyone's just going north to south, south to north. It's just a free for all. Uh, and really just showing that I think that's he, the way he pictures the future being that really this concept of native doesn't really mean anything once you're, you're there and you've moved for a certain number of uh, years, then it, it makes no difference. And it, like I said, it comes back to his upbringing and actually it marries in well with his actual circumstances. Yeah, very, really valid points there with regards to vulnerability. Um, because there's that quote that I think we've all kind of enjoyed, which was, we are all migrants through time. Uh, I know that when we initially discussed the book all those weeks ago, I asked you to finish up a quote for me, uh, which you might not remember, which was that a nation is only three meals away from a revolution. And I said, how many threes is it away from being a refugee? So he said, and so what was the answer to you both? I won't say Fahim's answer, but... Um, <laughs> Can't be one. I don't mind. <laughs> but, a citizen, but you did mention, though, didn't you, that a citizen yeah. is only three prime ministers away from being a refugee. Uh, thanks, Fahim, for letting me say that. But but quite clearly, there is vulnerability for all of us. I mean, we live in COVID times, and we all feel vulnerable to some degree with regards to that, and everybody has a different perception of vulnerability. But I think at times we forget that actually the boot could very much be on the other foot. And we have to always be um, understanding of the plight of these people. And they are humans. Uh, they may live 8,000 miles away, whatever they might be, but they all still have feelings and they need to make sure we do what we can to, to do what we can for them. I mentioned the whole thing about good refugee, good nature, because I was hoping that Faye might um, bring in his thoughts about good immigrants and, and that sort of thing. Because it is, I think that there's something here about do, do, when refugees come a lot, come, uh, what are the rights that they have, but what also are the responsibilities that they have? And also for the native population, what are our rights and responsibilities towards them? If we go through history, we've we've all come across individuals or groups that have been refugees at a particular point in time, whether it's because of political persecution or religious persecution or whatever else. Um, you mentioned obviously the states and, and how maybe those that maybe fled initially, it was due to religious persecution in Europe. Uh, but we've also got the same, a similar thing throughout other parts of the world. I mean, our own faith was sort of, has a strong element of refugee um, in the whole way that things kind of arose from there too. But, but you think about how maybe natives, because right now we are natives as far as these refugees are concerned. And I tried to figure out what he was trying to say there as to what is a good native. He talks about this young lady in Mykonos who's aiding the refugees and gets a door open for them to flee to London. There's some talk about the police, you mentioned there, Mehran, and showing restraint because that's what was required at that time. And giving the provisions for things like electricity, giving the house so they could be used. You've also then got, when they go to America, how certain individuals there helped uh, Nadia in the shop and made her feel part of the commune. But actually, in, rea in reality, there must be something there about what are the responsibilities of native people. And I think he kind of did allude towards the aspect. 
I think at times he was quite derogatory about natives. I think there was a lot of scenes there we thought, actually, they're quite hostile here. There's hostility where they've come from, which was maybe quite um, bloody. But there's also hostility here, which may be verbal in nature. It might be a threatening glance. It may be threatening behavior. It may be a gun being put at the lady when she's um, working as a, as a cashier. And it's a case of, he. I think there was a bit of balance there between the two. The, the good refugee part, I thought, for me, was he, he seems to indicate that as they go further west, there's an adoption of certain values and there's a diminishing of certain values. It, but, but I don't think it was uniform, though. So I find that with Saeed, he, if anything, becomes becomes more conservative the further west he goes. He attaches more relevance towards the values of the his country of origin as opposed to the land he's adopted. Whereas Nadia seems to kind of become almost all the shackles are off. She's still wearing the burqa, but in terms of her values, the shackles are off as she embraces her identity, which I'm not sure whether that was her true identity from the beginning, whether she became that way as she went further west. But I don't think he was too judgmental. I don't think he was judgmental about them, besides the point where Nadia becomes more accepted within the commune. But I didn't see the same acceptance really for Said. He was still with his clique of refugees from where he was from. Whereas Nadi seemed to have been embraced by the natives a lot. And I don't know what message he was trying to portray there, whether it was his intention to do so or not. I think to, to follow on that, uh, Zubair, I think, I personally think Said was grieving through that whole process. He left his, he left his father um, he didn't know what happened. And then when he arrived further west, then he heard news through a contact that, you know, he, he passed away after finally fighting a long bout of, I think it was pneumonia, wasn't it? Um, so just the same way his father sought company of his wife, who reminded him of his wife, he was, I think, finding that kind of refuge uh, pardon the pun, but a refuge from the, the same community that kind of reminded him of his father. And I think that perhaps made him very conservative because even in their interaction with, with Nadia, who conversely, she was, you know, um, she wanted to, to live independently. And then that was that was it. It was the, the family just became dismantled. It was just, you know, uh, she lived a very um, uh, isolated life. And there, was, there didn't seem to be any to and fro between her and her family uh, to, to a possible extent that they, they actually might have left without her. So there's, there's still a lot of anger. There may be some underlying animosity towards her own folk. Um, and maybe that's the reason why she tried to find pastures new. So I think that may be some of the reasons why they did what they did. I think I just want to say a bit about one passage in the book which helped me to answer that question and it was on page 149 um, and it talks about what you were saying Zubair um, in terms of actually why uh, Said was thinking more about returning to his roots perhaps and he says why would we want to move she said to be among our own kind Said answered who makes them our kind they're from our country from the country we used to be from yes Said tried not to sound annoyed We've left that place. That doesn't mean we have no connection. They're not like me. You haven't met them. And he goes on in this two for I thought that was good because he explains it. He basically identifies very closely with the people that he left behind. And yes, there's an element of grieving, but it's also his identity. Plus the fractured relationship he's now worked out. She's not for him. <laughs> he's yeah. figured that out. Okay. We've all figured that out. She's not for him. This ain't going to work. Okay. Again, spoiler alert, guys. It's not going to work. But uh, I think with that. <laughs> you screwed it. <laughs> I, know, I ruined it. <laughs> no happy ending here, guys. No, but whereas for her, she already, she was only wearing the robe we know so as to try and retreat from male attention in her society so it's a cultural thing not a religious reason she already had a fractious relationship with her family and she wasn't in touch and in that conservative society as an unmarried woman she was living away from her family and whether we take this as syria or as another south asian country or middle east whatever we take as that's still considered perhaps in some quarters as a, a non-conservative thing to do and she was doing that so for 
for her, it doesn't make sense to try and stick with the group because I left them all behind. Whereas for him, it does because that's part of the identity. And in some ways, you, you think about whether she's taking him away from what he wants and whether, you know, and there's that friction that's going on along with the relationship, along with the biggest societal issue we have as to what makes a good refugee and, and how they can integrate. I think yeah, that could yeah. be fair to say. Sorry, sorry for I was just going to say, you have to remember, he was the one that actually lived with his family, where she she left to be more independent because she she couldn't reflect herself onto her family and vice versa. So there was already that kind of you know yeah. divergent paths. Yeah, sorry, Zubair. No, thank you. Thanks, Maran. I think it'd be fair to say that Nadia was fleeing both the nation but also its people and its values. That was my take. When I said he was fleeing just the violence within the nation. But he wasn't fleeing the people or his values. I think that that was the impression I got, um, and I guess it probably shows the two kind, the the variation you get within refugees. That some refugees may indeed be fleeing the values of that nation holds, as well as the actual nation itself. Um, so we talked about doors, these wormholes that exist in these nations that go from one place to the next. I love the idea that Fahim had that maybe it'd be great to have that at the airport, no checking in, just get in and you're out. Um, I'm sure Fahim would have about 10 doors in his house if that was the case, one for each day of the week. Um, but let's ask a nice question. If you had a door, just one Fahim, where would it lead to? That's a, that's a hard question, I guess. Uh, don't say so Bangladesh. <laughs> don't say Bangladesh. Okay. I think it'd be somewhere that I really want to go to. And, it, and it's a pertinent question because with the COVID pandemic, we're going nowhere at the moment, right? So <laughs> I'm using this question not as a uh, full migration, just as a holiday. I'd go to Maldives, you know, because I want to go there. I've not been there before. And, you know, it's magic and it really saved me a lot of trouble at the airport. And I'd just get there and back and that'd be fine. <laughs> Is that your own form of quarantine for him? <laughs> yeah, I know. I think they're still under the two weeks, aren't they? I'm guessing there's no quarantine yeah, yeah, yeah. by that time. Okay. <laughs> it's, any, it's any, really, any, what about you, Mara? Any uh, any suggestions? It's really it's really difficult. I think um, I think rather than which door I'd like to go through or what what. I just feel in the current climate, I just hope people have those opportunities to see those doors because it's, um, you know, unfortunately with, with the whole COVID-19 pandemic, um, even just closer to home, the, the way it's impacted a lot of people um, and the way things are going again, it just makes you really worried, especially with, the you know, uh, winter looming, winter's coming. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so I, th I think it's just actually for more doors to be made available. Uh, so at least that that concept of hope, that concept of something brighter, because I guess that's that's the imagery of the door, isn't it? You don't know, and then suddenly there's light. Whereas the the last journey uh, that they had, a door was actually a room, so it was very secure, very confined. The boundaries are very, very well laid out, uh, and that perhaps was the reason that it was their home. Very, I know, Fame, you've obviously mentioned before that you're quite. Um privy to his interviews. Did he mention that he drew inspiration for the doors from C.S. Lewis? Or was it just his own? No, he, he did. He wouldn't admit to it. But he, he, when he was asked about these things, he said he realized why a lot of people would ask uh, that question, because it, it's the most logical thing when you come across this, that is line which in the wardrobe. Just to, just to follow on to what with uh, Meron was saying about the doors, I completely agree, because um, the concept of the doors in the actual book, it, it had this concept where if you're going from a poor country to a rich country, that there's a lot of strict checks and balances and so on. But if you're going the other way, you kind of just go, you know, as if you're a problem of our books kind of a picture. And I think we need to change that in the in the way we look at the world, that you can't look at it this way in those sort of fixed views. And, and we know that by having just by pure virtue of being born in one country over another, you have much more doors open to you, literally, yes. in terms of which countries you can go to either visa free or without having to fill in 10 pages of documents that someone's sponsoring you to go there and so on. You know, and, and I think we're, we're very privileged. Uh, I'm assuming we're all British in that sense, but British citizens in that we have, you know, so many countries that we can just, you know, go on a flight destination, book the holiday and you're there, really, yeah? Whereas that's not the case the inverse way. It's a long mammoth process. And for me, the doors make sense in equalizing things for everyone. Yeah. Well, it was interesting because when at Mykonos, the doors to go 
on towards other rich nations with heavenly God, as you mentioned, Fahim. And I love the way he, he kind of mentioned that the doors going the other way were not guarded in the hope that people may use them to go back to where they came from. I just wonder about repatriation there, whether he was trying to allude towards that aspect there in that in that part. Um, any favorite quotes that you guys want to bring up? Or I know I mentioned one myself before. Um, I've, I've done one. I did one that passage, yeah. I'll, let me I'll, I'll, I'll do one, but we actually have a question from a viewer. Um, it's from Sana Khan, who's we're just basically asking, is this book written as a narrative rather than a factual timeline non-fiction book? What, what are your thoughts on that? We'll go to Zubair first, I think. Zubair, you get the honor of answering that first. <laughs> Is it written as a narrative rather than a factual timeline non-fiction book? Good question. Um, thank you for the question, uh, first of all. I think the book probably would, I would argue, is, is written as, in some ways, as a narrative. It kind of details their journey from being in their host nation or their, sorry, their nation of origin, rather, and goes through how their journey goes from one place to the other it's obviously a fictional account it's not um non-fiction uh, in the way it's narrated although the the places mentioned are factual besides one or two places like the london halo um which we've not discussed yet um but we've all heard about the refugee camps in the greek islands we've we've heard about how how things work uh in terms of european and and the united states in terms of uh, the refugee um, cities there Obviously, the other aspects are very much fictional and the way they're portrayed. He thankfully doesn't mention those groups that maybe were active in the, the nation they come from. And I think he did, it was wise to kind of avoid that, that discussion because it gives you know, us the opportunity just actually to focus on their, their status as the refugees. Yeah, and just to add to that, perhaps um, when we talk about a factual timeline, there were lots of instances where you just suddenly walked into another place, um, you know, talking about it, an interaction between between people, one being Australia, another being in, in Europe, etc. So I think it's um, it still kind of fuels the conversation, but it's and you do suddenly wonder why why have we why have I suddenly disappeared to another place. Um, so just in terms of the timeline, I think that just makes it a little bit more destructured, uh, or unstructured, I should say. Yeah, um, he talks about the the guy, the accountant, isn't it, in London, who's just going to Namibia, and that's just thrown in, and he, he's at a, quite a dark point in life. I didn't really like the way that was done, because I thought, not not promoting taking your own life, but it's coming close to describing the, the things that he was doing, and it's quite a dark part of the book. Um, yeah. But it also gave a bit of comparison to the narrative of always going from a poorer country to a richer country and being happy because he was going from England to Namibia. So, I mean, but that there was just a small section of the book, so it wasn't given equal sort of uh, status to the other comparison of going west all the time to, to seek uh, this. But, yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, the last chapter at the end really makes you think about that because you wonder, is that a dream sequence or is that did it really happen? And, you know, I say real in, an, in a fiction book, you know what I mean, but as, as real as anything else in a fiction book. Um, so, so that you just wonder if that's a factor, and, and by the end, I wasn't sure either. But going back to your questions there about the quote, um, so the one that still kind of rings uh, rings in my ears is on page ninety four, and I think it says, "For for when we migrate, we yes. murder from our lives uh, those we leave behind," um, and. It's quite difficult to take actually because we have to think that um you know my family has been maybe not a refugee's journey but the, the clearly migrant journey and and we all have uh and what actually uh you know the significance of that um perhaps it was it was a, it was a means of you know positively going back at some point uh, and in essence we became economic migrants during the whole process but then something clearly made us stay and we see ourselves as native in this country. So it's, um, mm. and, and that's, that's where the kind of how you interact with society once you arrive and once you stabilize, there's obviously those concepts of accommodation and assimilation, um, keeping your own cultural heritage, but at the same time embracing the heritage that you, uh, that you currently reside in. So that's obviously the, uh, the balance that we try, need to try to make. 
Thank you for that, Matt, because I was hoping you'd bring that up because obviously that's quite personal, I think, to us three because we've all had people migrate that are very close to us, whether it's our parents or grandparents. And I thought it was quite a, a callous remark, really, because um, we obviously they left people behind, mm. whatever is India or Bangladesh or whatever else, but there was an appreciation of why they were left behind. Mm. It wasn't left behind to kind of fend for themselves, but purely so that others could help to maybe support them in some ways and maybe open up opportunities elsewhere. But at the same time, by virtue of migrating, there's a huge amount of things that are missed out from each other, whether it was just the usual weekend things or whether it was eats or, or, or birthdays or even sometimes weddings and stuff. Mm -hmm. so I think it is true that unfortunately with migration, whether it's as an economic migrant, whether it's as a refugee or for any other reason, sadly, those that maybe you have grown up with or those who you love as family, they in many ways become distant from you and, and don't really share some of that journey with you unless you have the provision to bring them across for every single special occasion but otherwise for most people that's not really a possibility and i could understand why there was that i actually thought the other reason why that call was mentioned was um because Said's father sadly was left behind because he said that leave me behind and and because of that reason i think um i think by side leaving he probably ended up letting his father pass on because if he took him with him there was a good chance that his father would have lived on but by being left behind the access to medication simple things like antibiotics wasn't there mm. whereas maybe if he was in london or mykonos or california mm -hmm. a simple gp visit would have been sufficient to get a course of penicillin or macrolide mm -hmm. So I think maybe that's probably why it was mentioned there. There's one other quote that I've, that was quite relative. Uh, so again, the author, they mentioned why they traveled, sees himself as a mongrel sometimes because of the number of um, cultures he's imbibed. And he mentioned one thing, which is in this group, everyone was foreign. And so in a sense, no one was almost to a sense that if we all become migrants, if we're all foreign, and if we see ourselves as being migrants, then we won't see anybody else as being a migrant or a refugee. Mm -hmm. Now, it, I think the, the virtue here is if we all see ourselves as being off the land, this is my land, because it was my dad's land, and his granddad's land, going back so many generations to William the Conqueror or the invasions of Babur or whoever else it might be, then anybody that comes that maybe doesn't have the same journey as you becomes by virtue of that fact a migrant and an other. But if we all view ourselves as being, well, I, I only came here when I was born and prior to that I was elsewhere or didn't exist in this world, then maybe anybody that moves into the land that we, we reside in or, or sort of you know, take value in is no longer an other, but actually the same as us. And and going back to what Fahim was saying about native and refugees and good good and bad migrants, if we just see ourselves as, as all being citizens of the world, th I think there's harm in that because I think you then become a citizen of nowhere. And then it, nobody really is attached to any particular place and therefore doesn't really value any particular nation and then look after it. But there is something about maybe just thinking that if we all viewed ourselves as being migrants in some way, and as being foreign in some way to any part of the world, whether it's a place we've been born in or, or moved to, that we might see others that have recently moved in a more positive light. Mm. Any thoughts on that? I think that's a good point, um, Zuber, in terms of thinking about the whole concept of citizenship and what it means to different people. And um, I think it would help equalize it, though, if we all thought of global citizens, because it, it gives rise to the nation state and the concept of the nation state and how important that is to people, because they directly assume that if you are living within a prescribed borders, geographical borders, that you share the same ideals and values broadly speaking, with everyone in that country, which makes you a citizen, which may or may not uh, be the same as someone in a different geological or geographical area of the world. And that may or may not be true, because I think everyone has different 
interests, identities, beliefs. And so there's a lot of commonalities amongst us throughout the world, but um, the concept of trying to have these specific nations, because then it sort of builds a hierarchy of nations in the world. You then think, well, if there's all these different nations, there's got to be a number one, because that's how it always works. There's got to be a number 110. This, <clears throat> so you've always got to have a hierarchy, and I, I don't like the concept of the hierarchy because that, that's man-made of which one's better, and it's just based on personal taste. But if they're all given the great, and I think the United Nations and all these concepts were there to try and help with these ideologies, but whether it succeeded is for other people to guess. But really, the concept of the nation state is very strong at the moment in the world. And I think uh, from what I see of uh, separation and independence of new countries, countries don't seem to regret becoming independent generally they're not saying oh, I, I, it's a bad idea let's go back to how it was they generally still want to make a go of it um, and will, will not admit to it being a bad idea so no. i think it's here to stay the concept of uh, the global citizen although it's a nice concept how practical is it in terms of what we do um effectively but as long as we know there are other people out there who need as much help or, and that we're just fortunate in where we're living which i said at the beginning and what uh, the benefit of the red passport gives us a you know, how many doors we can actually open compared to other people through no particular actual uh, thing that we did by not actually virtue of any work we did. Um, I think that gives us humility. That's very nice for me. I think the the difficulty at the moment is it's um, with every nation, they're not, no one's willing to go first in terms of loosening the, the boundaries and the barriers, are they? Uh, and, then to, and then subsequently understanding the benefits of that. Uh, everyone seems to be, if anything, digging their heels in a bit more. Uh, maybe it's survival instincts. I'm not sure, and and perhaps this is the, the consequence of capitalism. Um, you know, that's um, that's why when when you when you talked about migration at the at the beginnings of there about the uh, you know the number of million, we have to remember back about 250 years ago, the Great Famine in Bengal, about 10 million people died. Um, this is a, th a third of the whole population um, uh, of that region mm -hmm. but without without the uh, connectivity without the understanding and uh, the opportunities that, that perhaps possess now you, you're going to have subsequently an issue about migration so mm -hmm. I think I think migration is something that's natural um, but um, as, as you said the humanizing needs to come from oneself um, and, and the fact that you know when when we talk about that point about we are all migrants, some people, um, and especially when you go through the internet and people talking about, some people actually say, no, I'm not, I'm not a migrant. I've, I've lived here for generations, but it's, you know, the way um, life has evolved, everyone has moved from one place to the next um, and taken refuge or uh, taken some kind of seed or opportunity or learn something yeah. to take to an, uh, to another country. So that journey will, will never end. And I think we just yeah. need to accept that. Uh, and that's where the global citizen, I guess, comes in. And it's also the concept of like, you know, when you do DNA tests on people, they're often surprised mm -hmm. where they see their ancestry is. So even people who might think that everything is from England, they're like, oh, I didn't expect someone from <laughs> South America or something when they actually do these tests. So I think yes. that can be quite a humbling and eye opening experience for people who do that, who may have quite entrenched views um, regarding immigration, should we say, to put it politely. Yeah. Once they actually undergo that process and realize, well, actually, I do have ancestry in other parts, you know, and we can all root, go back to the African obviously dispersed you know at the beginning but I think a lot of us wouldn't like to think that way for whatever you know reason that is people have no. their own agendas um, so, so it's interesting to sometimes point out the elephant in the room to people all right thank you guys there's a, a whole host of other things within this book we could talk about that is black robe and what that symbolized we could have talked about the the difficulties that um, ensue from losing loved ones in a war-torn nation the the loss of um close love loved ones and people that we don't know and and the whole rat race that was involved in being a refugee the book itself is a love story we've not really talked about that a great deal probably because we're all guys um but there's lots of other book clubs that do do so so if that's your thing by all means do log on to that sort of thing um but for him it was quite clear that that was something that maybe we could leave for another time um because it isn't really i mean just as quickly mentioning it it's 
it's not a fantastic love story. They don't get together at the end, so it's quite realistic. Mm. But it's not really one for um, cold wet nights. Let's put it that way. It's not going to make you feel any good. I don't believe. Unless you want to say anything there for him. I'll, I'll <laughs> no, I, th I think no. I think I felt like a, a sweaty six former <laughs> at times when I was reading some of the. Pro I thought, hang on, what am I reading here? <laughs> so um, yeah, I think I think the the love yeah. story is an important part of it, yes. and it, it binds it all together. You know, yes. it's a uh, it's the flower of the glue. cake. It is it the glue, is. isn't it? it is. So it's good. I think maybe if I can add one thing, Zabay. I sure. mean. There was there was a concept of Islam and how that's portrayed and religiousness, yeah. which Mehran yeah. mentioned. Is there anything you guys thought about that? Because I thought that was interesting. Because the robe obviously is a form of Islam uh, in for certain people in in wearing that, and obviously it goes back to Saeed praying and not praying, praying not praying. <laughs> it's sort of like uh, going back and forward. He's having a good day, a bad day. It seemed, and uh, just um, just the concept of uh, because it's set in the Muslim world. I think it's fair to say this uh, book uh, where they start off. And what did you guys make of uh, Islam? and its portrayal? I think there was lots of, um, you know, visual imagery about Islam and what, what it means. Obviously, it talks about the black robe and, and, uh, and the fact they will hide your body as well as modesty, etc. But there was also interactions where um, uh, Nadia was on, on a motorcycle and a male interacted with her and because she didn't respond, he started abusing her quite, quite emphatically. Um, so I think, you know, when, when we think about Islam, it's, I think we, we just need to think about what's, what cannot be seen. Uh, so it needs to be around personality. It needs to be around qualities and values. Uh, and I think it does come out between their relationship, even though they, they knew that um, something wasn't right. They knew that they needed each other to get to the next destination. And so, so that concept of loyalty, togetherness, um, obviously complete out of bounds in terms of, you know, they weren't married. But that's that's not what we're talking about. So it's um, uh, and his his father knew that his father knew that uh, you know um, Sadia was um, sorry Nadia was very important for him in terms of his journey and the, yeah. and she obviously made that oath to him. It was very judgmental. The book was in that regard, um, but mm. I, I don't think it was meant to be a religious book either. From from yeah. what I could see, it was more of a case of just bringing certain nuggets in here and there, but but not really giving much depth in terms of what the faith really meant to the to the to the two individuals concerned. There was other things there about animals and how they were portrayed, and and that imagery was quite interesting. I thought about the book. Okay, so we always had to judge things. So out of five, any any take us for the first review for him? Go on, you're ready, I think. <laughs> I can't hear you, sorry. I said a solid three out of five. Solid three. Oh, that's good. That's very generous of you. <laughs> yeah. Mehran? I'm I'm gonna go with three as well. Yeah. It's it's a it's a it's a good book, but then I, I have to keep having to compare it to the books I've given four and I didn't feel it it met to that. Yeah. I think I'd give it a three myself as well. I think it was spot on there because as good as it was, there were things that maybe you thought it could have been done differently, um, but it's been made into a movie. So quite clearly, there's a lot of people that do appreciate it for its artistic value and its uh, value to to the migrant and refugee story. Um, it also makes me curious, though, about other Pakistani authors, because I'm quite curious now to see who else is out there and what sort of things they write about and, and whether they write the same as he does. So if you do, guys, if you guys have any recommendations about me, do let me know. Or maybe we can pass it on to our listeners also. I guess that's it, unfortunately, for, for this one. Um, Mehran, do you want to talk about next month's book? Yeah, so, so next month, hopefully, we're going to be talking about a book called When Breath Becomes Air. So it's a non-fiction autobiographical book uh, about an American neurosurgeon called Paul uh, Kalanithi. Um, and I'm really interested to understand why this book stayed on you know on the new york times bestseller for about 68 weeks um so it's about death it's about uh the process that he had to go through and the reflections and i think there's also really nicely written epilogues so i'm looking forward to to reading that sounds fascinating well thanks a lot for your um company as always this evening guys hopefully we'll meet one day face to face but as things stand, we're still doing this virtually, which isn't quite the same, admittedly. But um, it's been nice to have your company as always this evening. See you next time. Oh, Bye. just one more thing, Bahim. 
Do you want yeah. to talk about the oh. e event? Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, we just want to make a, a plug for what we're doing as part of Med Talks on October 11th, Sunday, October 11th, between 5 to 7 p.m. We're hosting a Global Health Promotion 2020. It's a, a virtual event uh, with a, a distinguished number of speakers who will be talking about challenges in the medical world, speaking for about eight to ten minutes each. Uh, don't miss it. Please uh, do uh, log in. We've got a link on uh, Zoom as well, and it should be a really informative and educational evening uh, or late afternoon, should I say. So I hope you do can join us and please uh, put that in your diary. Yeah, and thank you, Zubair, for sharing this book. It was, uh, it was great catching up with you guys as always. Take care. Thanks. Bye.